welcome to the Book Club Review, the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. Today, we bring you a special episode, not strictly book club related, but who could turn down the opportunity to talk to such an interesting reader? Historian, academic, documentary maker, journalist and cultural polymath, he is Simon Sharma. A familiar voice then to many, but what you might not know about him is that he is a keen fiction reader. He was in town to pick up his knighthood from Buckingham Palace, and we sat down to talk books, writing, and how his reading has informed his work. I wondered, though, how he manages to find the time to read for pleasure. It's generally means of transport, you know, planes, on flights, which, as you know, I do a lot of. I don't watch TV, I don't watch movies, I don't drink on planes. Used to, absolutely don't touch the spot, don't go to sleep. I mean, if it's overnight, I will. But I try and get day flights everywhere. So planes and trains, I do loads and loads of reading. As you get, you know, really old and you're shuffling off sooner or later to the exit, you want to read more and more. You actually want to read stuff that, you know, you say, I've got to read this before I croak. On the other hand, my way of coping with telling the Grim Reaper to piss off is actually to do more and more work. So that leaves less and less time for reading rather than more and more. But I do read late at night, but I mostly read short stories and poems. Poetry sends me to sleep happy. Occasionally, if it's poetry, it gets under the skin, of course, unhappy, and then uh, you always wake up at three o'clock in the morning. But the two great opportunities to read fiction in particular are when I review it, and there's precious weeks of holiday in the summer. I don't go anywhere near a church. Well, occasionally I do. Don't go anywhere near an art gallery. Occasionally I do. But mostly what I do is shop, cook, and read, and that's it. So I get an awful lot of reading done there. And have you always loved reading fiction? Oh, yeah. In fact, actually, at school, I was really, really torn about whether I was going to do English or history at university. And if I had done English, I would have had a crack at being... uh, I have written one work of fiction, of course, actually, and that's Dead Certainties, which a lot of people refuse to recognise as fiction, but I actually say, hey, I've made things up. It's called a novel, or novellas in that case. But um, if I was doing English, it was absolutely with an eye to being a fiction writer. And in fact, when I decided to do history, my English teacher, who was the best teacher I've ever had in my life at either school or university... He was so upset, he wouldn't talk to me for six months. He actually literally didn't talk to me. He kind of went off in a kind of jilted sulk. And it took years and years for him to correspond with me in any way at all. (laughs) But I think it's been noticed by other people. A lot of the history, maybe not at the very beginning, but certainly starting with citizens, most obviously. I think actually in The Embassment of Riches, but certainly with citizens. I then, without writing fiction... A lot of the devices about pace and character and plot and so on are not dissimilar from what would happen. They're probably, again, in novellas or long short stories rather than in a complete novel from end to end. The one that is most like a novel from end to end is Rough Crossings, which, again, is purely nonfiction. Nothing in that book isn't documented. But there, I wrote it very quickly, and it was based on a very compact set of sources. And I was very conscious of pace and scene and diction and the voices. I felt very ventriloquist-like, letting those voices have a lot of space to play so that people really cared about them. And the characters move all the way through to the end of the book. So I'm a kind of, you know, a sort of secret fiction writer in the guise of a non-fiction writer, I guess. And the only way to do that, actually, is to read loads and loads and loads of fiction. And are there any particular historical novelists that you like or who have somehow informed your work? Yeah, loads. The most obvious one, I read it about eight or nine times, I can't remember quite which, War and Peace, which I started, you know, (laughs) one of my best friends at university, now alas dead, much too soon, he was crazed about Tolstoy. And I ran Anna Karenin and thought it was, you know, maybe the best book ever written. But I was like everybody else, 1,200 pages, he's going to make things up about Napoleon and I don't need this. And so actually I read it while on a holiday job from school. I was the only straight in the soft furnishings department of liberties. <laughs> it's absolutely true. And uh, to escape, you know, from the soft furnishings department, I went round a corner. It was the early days of Carnaby Street and there was a place called Cranks. It was a veggie restaurant. And I finally cracked open war and peace and I absolutely couldn't put it down to all that was extraordinary and this old guy came and sat he was sort of rather retired army type with salt and pepper whiskers and he sat opposite me and I thought hello but no he said excuse me young man 
I mean, I remember it very clearly. He said, I see you're setting out, because I was about 100 pages in, on the great journey. He said, I am myself on my 12th time or something like that. And he said, is this your first time? <laughs> and I said, oh, yes. And he said, oh, you have a magnificent experience ahead of you. And he was right. It, it, it was. I'm a terrible war and peace bore. I made a 30-minute film about it for BBC a long time ago for the big read. I'm the worst possible critic of any broadcast or television version of War and Peace because you become a bit of a pattern. But other than Tolstoy, I love Education Sentimental, Sentimental Education, Flaubert's novel, which is set in the 1848 revolution. I loved not Solzhenitsyn's First World War epic, which is sort of glaze making, but he did, I think it's called Seventh Circle, one set in period of the Stalinist Tyrell, which was astonishing. I love Zhivago when I first read it. Then I tried to reread it about five years ago. And I thought, wow, you know, he should have gone to the Tolstoy Academy of Coherent Plot and the whole devices got in the way of the integrity of the book somehow. It's really odd. Uh, Lampedusa's The Leopard is one of my absolute favourites. You know, I read stuff that are not historical novels as well, but I do read a lot of them. Barry Unsworth, Sacred Hunger, O Book Club. That is an unbelievably great... I can't remember if it won. I think it won the Booker. It's about the slave trade and Liverpool at the end of the 18th century. And he seemed to be a staggering writer, you know, who's going to have an extraordinary career ahead of him, and didn't. I mean, he sort of disappeared. I am a Wolf Hawley. I do think she's extraordinary. I think I need to get over her French Revolution book, which I hated. So I think it's getting me in the way of completely relaxing into Hilary Mantel. But she is an amazing... I love her short stories, actually, more than I do the, the Cromwell work. But she is obviously amazing. I'm one of the only non-Italians, I think, who read and loved Manzoni, Promessi Smosi, you know, The Betrothed. All Italian kids used to have to read that novel, and rather like Russian kids with War and Peace, they absolutely come out hating it, because it's such a kind of obligatory duty, sort of rite of passage in secondary school, which is too bad. I think Marquez's General and His Labyrinth about Simon Bolivar's very underrated book, rather wonderful book. I would say, actually, when you're really thinking about your voice in... Oh, I must mention Margaret Yosler, very important, Memoirs of Hadrian. And the reason I suddenly remembered her, great, great historical novelist, is that she has the best essay I know in a collection of essays called That Mighty Hammer Time, about the choice of speech when she wrote this fake autobiographical memoir, The Emperor Hadrian, and she thought very hard... And she developed what she called a kind of toga voice, which is part public, part kind of faux private confessional. And that makes me think sometimes quite self-consciously about the voice of certain chapters. And for me, sometimes that voice changes within a book. In Belonging, the volume two of the Jews, the voice of a chapter all about an 18th century Jewish boxer is quite deliberately of that I not of that period, because I, I don't want to go anywhere near pastiche, but it tries to catch the kind of echo of people who would see that boxing match. So it's going to be quite different from the chapter about Jewish, Chinese, Mandarins, for example. So I think about that, and very often it's absolutely contemporary fiction, which makes you think about that, not necessarily an historical novel at all. So every kind of fiction, I think, sort of feeds into the kind of possible choices. And there may be possible choices that you want to do that you actually can't do. It's not in your repertoire, you know. There are some short story writers who I just find unbelievably electrifying, like everybody does. Alice Munro is the top of the list, I think, really. Tell us your favourites. Who's my absolute favourite? Well, of living, her, for sure. Another very underrated short story writer. She has the long short stories, but they are jaw-droppingly terrifying. Anyone listening to this, do not read this before you go to sleep. It's Daphne du Maurier. It's incredible writing. God, that woman could write. She wrote Don't Look Now, you know, the, the scary movie, and the other scary movie, The Birds. And it's much scarier as a story than it was in Hitchcock's film. Both of them are actually scary. I love incredibly scary films. But all of the stories are extraordinary pieces of imaginative writing and have a beautiful architecture as well to them. And where do you like to shop for your books? You divide your time between London oh, and I, New York, don't you? Yeah. Do you have a preferred bookstore in each city? 
Yes. Well, I do like the nearest local one, you know, Daunt's Maryland High Street is absolutely lovely. And they are so nice. In New York, we have an independent bookshop in Pleasantville, New York. And it's tiny, but it will get anything for you. It has a real hunch about what to stock in fiction and non-fiction. And there's Roy and Yvonne. And they love me, I love them, and they phone me up if they think there's something they've spotted that I haven't clocked, and um, that is just fantastic. You know, the suburb's pretty damn bloody boring, so there's a coffee shop and a bookshop, and a real bookshop. I love going in there. What's the name of the bookshop? It's called the Pleasantville Bookstore. And is that where you get your tips for what to read next? Yeah, that and, you know, reading Usual Suspects, reading New York Times. Have you got something that you've read recently that you would really recommend? Have we talked about Exit West, which I think is a staggering novel? I was completely bowled over by that book. I thought it was a perfect book, really. You didn't think that as the story went on and it got further away from the two main characters and more into the ideas that somehow you lost the emotional engagement? A little. At the very end, he can't find a way of winding up that wouldn't be a kind of artificially sentimental. I kind of sympathise. I have a secret novel, very little of which is written, but I know the plot exactly. And the reason I haven't taken a year off to write it properly is that the ending is so monstrously dark that I can't quite see a way to write it. So I saw that his only ending was sort of hopelessly sentimental or a petering out. I could have done probably without the San Francisco scenes. The London thing is so fantastically dystopian in a kind of utterly credible way. You know, some books are imperfect and broken and there are all sorts of things about them which are surplus to requirement and you think, oh, you know, better editor and so on. And that, you know, goes for Dickens, <laughs> um, not for Tolstoy or Flaubert, I think. But you think still, broken though they are, they're better than many perfect books. So I'm sort of prepared to forgive that, really, if they deliver something else that's wonderful. Mm. Yeah, I know it definitely did that, no question. And do you have a recommendation for something that you think would make a good book club book? Yes, I do, because it's a book about books, but that may instantly put you off, but it shouldn't. And this is by an author called Edward Wilson Lee, who I'd never heard of. And it arrived on my desk to review for the Financial Times, and I'm doing so. And it's called The Catalogue of Shipwrecked Books. And it's an astonishing piece of writing. He previously wrote a book called Shakespeare in Swahili Land, which is indeed about the performance of Shakespeare in Africa, which reminded me of the young Bruce Chatwin. He does actually very much remind me of the of the young Bruce Chapman, which is really quite a compliment. He's that good. He's an English John at Cambridge. This book, The Catalogue of Shipwreck Books, is about Christopher Columbus's son, Hernando, who was involved as a teenager with his father's last voyages, which were staggering, epic, tragic <laughs> events. But we have the narrative of Columbus's life and voyages, mostly through Hernando. He was an illegitimate son, thereby lies a real story of Columbus. But his voyage of exploration is to create a universal library. And that sounds like, oh no, I really don't want to read a book about building a library. But believe me, you do, actually. <laughs> it's just the quality of the writing, the historical writing, is so exciting and so thrilling. And so it's a poetically observed book, by which I mean I always tell my history students to go and read lots of poetry, because poetry actually has to, if it works, really be very concrete and physical and tangible in its observations, doesn't it? At least the poets I like best, like Derek Walcott and Brodsky and Auden are very much poets of extremely acute physical textural observation. And he, Edward Wilson Lee, has that quality, whether he's talking about a Roman street or the look of a pope or the way a ship sails or what a map is like. So for me, it's really spellbinding. It's one of these, wherever he is in the book, and he's in many different places, as was Hernando Colon, you're completely there. I mean, it's slightly over-exhaustive in describing surroundings and organised books by subject. Again, it sounds so dull. All I would say is it's not, it's unbelievably thrilling. He's the first person to see that you don't just want the classics in your library. You want rubbish literature, really. You want pop literature. So it's the best history book I've read for I don't know how many years. 
Sounds great. I think we're definitely going to have to read that one. Simon, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure, Kate. Thank you. That's all for this episode. Simon's book suggestions flew thick and fast, so here's a recap of a few you might want to take note of. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, A Sentimental Education by Gustave Flaubert, In the First Circle by Alexander Solonitsyn, The Leopard by Giuseppe Tomasi de Lampedusa, Sacred Hunger by Barry Unsworth, Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel, and for her short stories, try The Assassination of Margaret Thatcher. Simon also mentioned The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, The General and His Labyrinth by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and Marguerite Usenar's Memoirs of Hadrian and her essay collection That Mighty Sculptor Time. And don't forget that book club recommendation, The Catalogue of Shipwrecked Books by Edmund Wilson Lee. Simon's latest book is Belonging, The Story of the Jews from 1492 to 1900 which was shortlisted for one of our favourite awards, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction. Always some great book club books on that list. Our next book club show is On Normal People by Sally Rooney, a coming-of-age love story set in post-financial crisis Ireland. It's won a raft of awards, while Rooney has been dubbed the voice of a generation, but did Laura's book club find it lived up to the hype? Listen in to find out. If you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or email thebookclubreview at gmail.com and tell us about your book club. And if you're not already, why not subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>